Good evening. Thank you for responding. Now I'm going to ask something else of you. All those you who are back where the light doesn't catch you, you need to move up so we can see your wonderful faces. And um, as I always say, I was a teacher, so I can wait you out. Come on, let's have a few of you move forward. Uh, we really cannot see those who are in the back. And this is meant to be um, engaging for, for these folks as well as all of you. Thank you, thank you. See, we've got some good folks here who are moving it on up. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. There are no more reserved seats anymore, so go ahead and sit in the front. <laughs> oh, clever. <laughs> okay. okay, there are things going through my head about those of you who have refused to move, but... <laughs> I shall not say them out loud. So, hello. <laughs> I'm Kathy Getz. I'm the president of the university here at Mercyhurst, and it's a real privilege for me to welcome you here tonight. I know that those of you who have been here uh, throughout the day have had a wonderful time. I have heard nothing but positives about the sessions that have come before during the day. So, uh, thank you for those who presented, who led groups of discussions, and all of you who came back for uh, this celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Intel program. So I actually celebrated my one year anniversary at, U at Mercyhurst as the president um, not too long ago. So I don't have this rich history with the Intel program that many of you have, but it was definitely one of the things that I learned about early and that really resonated with me that uh, led me to really want to be part of this institution. Um, as I was interviewing for this job, as I was meeting people after I got here, the word Intel kept being spoken by so many people. We've got an Intel program of which we are so proud. And I have learned over the past year wh what that pride is all about. I have learned it's, um, it's not false pride. It's, it's, a, it's actually a very humble pride that uh, reflecting, I guess, the mercy tradition. We are proud of this program, but we're proud because it has served so many of you so well over the years, and it continues to do so. It does so much good for your employers. It does so much good for our students in finding their way. I met with a handful of alumni first thing this morning, and to a person, they attribute their success to the Intel program here at Mercyhurst. That speaks volumes, and it speaks volumes of the people who are sitting here in the front because they have uh, the, the distinction of being the ones who had the foresight to develop the program. So we're celebra celebrating, as I said, 30 years, um, and we're really honored to have all of you here. Um, very happy to see them here. I'm not going to introduce them because that's Lindy's job. Um, but I uh, just want to uh, welcome Lindy again. She's been with us for four months. And um, I think I did that subtraction correctly. And, and uh, has been become quickly a real asset for the program. So she is a, the newest trailblazer, but she's sitting with two other trailblazers here at Mercyhurst and in the field of intelligence. So let's all give them a round of applause even before they speak. And it's my pleasure really to introduce Lindy Smart, the executive director of the Intel program here at Mercyhurst, and she's going to lead this panel discussion. So Lindy.
Thank you, Dr. Goetz. Thank you all for joining us here tonight and for those on live stream, thank you for joining us remotely. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just thank the students, especially the Tiger team, the GAs, the faculty, the staff, for all coming together to make this possible. Without you, we couldn't have put such an incredible celebration together. So thank you all, I appreciate you. You can't think of intelligence in academia without immediately thinking Bob Heibel. You can't think of the tremendous growth of the intelligence studies program at Mercyhurst without immediately envisioning Jim Breckenridge. Alum, get ready, I'm just gonna be interactive real quick, okay? If you're an alum, you can't think of the hardest or the best intel class you ever took without thinking of Shout out some professors' names that impacted you. Sit. Sit. To, <laughs> if you're a student today, you have the privilege, privilege of learning from the dedicated faculty that continue to push the envelope on evolving the program providing incredible opportunities to our students and mentoring day in and day out. Faculty, if you would stand up, wave, whatever you're most comfortable doing. Uh, Dr. Leslie Gelcher. <laughs> Dr. Jake Mosley. <laughs> Dr. Fred Hoffman. Professor Peter Korea, Colonel. <laughs> Professor Deb Davies. <laughs> Dr. Brooke Shannon. <laughs> Dr. Deline Duvenage. And alum, Professor Will Brocious. Thank you for defining the next 30 years with your commitment to all you do here. Thank you. We've become who we are because of the people in this room. Think of the people in this room that have influenced your life and career, your life. What started here has allowed you to now move on out into the world and influence a new generation evolve intelligence, and build on the legacy of what those in this room, especially these two, have built. I am honored <laughs> to reacquaint or introduce you to Mr. Bob Heibel and Dr. Jim Breckenridge. If you were here yesterday, you heard me share that one of the amazing things I have heard in the short time I've been here over and over again is how can I help? And that includes Jim and Bob. Within hours of me reaching out to Bob, he asked what he could do to support me. Since then, I've continued to seek Bob's counsel, good laughs, lots of notes, and um, already a few tears. I'm sorry, Bob. <laughs> Jim, you've provided me with invaluable strategic advice. How to prioritize, how to break, things, how to break challenges down into tangible results. Thank you. Both tell me, as many of you had in this room, I'm here for whatever this program needs. I'm thankful for the support we receive and wanted to share that as a testament to the leadership of this program for the love of this program. Some haven't set foot campus on year, in years, yet the first thing they say is how can I help serve this intelligence studies program? How you can hurt, uh, help serve is to stay engaged. The public and private sector are evolving so fast and our intelligence program must keep pace. We have to stay relevant and I will rely on you to guide us, challenge us, and celebrate us with these students. The vision for the future stays true to the legacy. National security is and will continue to be vital. 
just because I'm corporate, just because I'm private sector, doesn't mean we're going 100% corporate and this is gonna be like intelligence studies LLC. No, not going to happen. We will stay rooted and applied, rooted in real world experience. But now more than ever, the speed at which global forces move, the massive amounts of data, the interdisciplinary nature of the public and private sector requires us not to drastically evolve, but to reinforce those interdisciplinary skills needed. Strong OSINT, GEOINT, human, collections, analysis, working with other fields in data science and cyber, but also reinforcing the humanities that make this program great and the ethics of this program. Reinforce the underlying, not the career path, to allow great flexibility for our students if they want to adjust their careers. Tonight, we'll hear from these great leaders of intelligence and how they built this program that we are so honored to be a part of. How they built this program from a classroom in the library to the beautiful Center for Academic Excellence. From RIEP to Mercyhurst Mafia. From these two to all of us. Uh, before I kick it over to these two gentlemen, I'll start with their uh, biography. So starting with you, short. I cut out maybe like two paragraphs. So. Mr. Bob Heibel is a 25-year veteran of the FBI. Heibel served as its deputy chief of counterterrorism, retiring in 1987. He holds a master's degree from Georgetown University and in 1992 founded the award-winning RIAP here at Mercyhurst. The four, first four-year college undergraduate program of its kind, it was designed to generate quality entry-level entry analysts establishing, um, excuse me, for government and private sector. In 2004, the college established the Institute for Intelligence Studies, which housed the world's largest full-time applied intelligence studies graduate and under, in undergraduate programs, and the Center for Intelligence Research Analysis and Training, CRAT, a nonprofit designed to exploit open source information. Over 1,800 students have graduated from its program. In recognition of his service in 2012, the university announced the creation of an endowed chair in his name, the Robert J. Heibel Distinguished Chair of Intelligence Studies. Upon his departure of Mercyhurst in 2016, he was designated Director Emeritus of the Center for Intelligence Studies. He currently directs Applied Intelligence Studies LLC at Consultancy, which assists academic training institutions in developing applied intelligence study programs at various levels. Mr. Bob Heibel has served on the board of directors of several international intelligence and law enforcement associations and is a founder and chairman emeritus of the Intelligence Association for Intelligence Education. <laughs> in 2001, Skip presented him with its lifetime, the highest recognition, the Meritorious Award, and in 2006, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award for his work in open source intelligence. Dr. James Breckenridge is the provost of the U.S. Army War College. He supervises all academic and leadership development programs to ensure quality coordination and integration. Dr. Breckenridge was the founding dean of the Ridge College of Intelligence studies and applied sciences at Mercyhurst University and the executive director of the college's research arm, the Institute for Intelligence Studies. Previously, as the dean of the Walker School of Business and chair of the Intelligence Studies program, he initi initiated the Interdisciplinary Business Intelligence Program. In 2010, he founded and served as the chair organizer for the biennial Global Intelligence Forum held in Dungarvan, Ireland. Appointed as the first chair of the Department of Intelligence Studies at Mercyhurst, he designed the curriculum changes and gained accreditation for the new major in intelligence studies in 2002, the graduate program in applied intelligence in 2004, and the graduate certificate in 2005. Dr. Breckenridge has designed and taught courses in the intelligence analysis and leadership domains to executive and analysts working for government AGs, agencies, including the Department of State, Department of Defense, of Homeland Security, and of Energy. Working under the U.S. State Department, Breckenridge led interdisciplinary teams that provided leadership, anti-terrorism and intelligence training in offices in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Southeastern nations. Mr. Heibel 
Dr. Breckenridge, thank you for joining us here tonight. Bob, I'd like to hand it over to you, please. It is truly a sincere pleasure for me to be here tonight to, to take you down a memory lane that becomes I-95. <laughs> and if you'll bear with me for a moment, uh, a little background. My wife and I, my wife Suzanne and I uh, grew up in Erie. Uh, I went to Gannon College, took a ROTC commission, served four years in the infantry. Uh, we left in 1959 and didn't really come back till 1986. Uh, in 1963, I was fortunate enough to, to be able to become an FBI agent. And over the following 24 years, much of the time that I put in was as a counter-terrorist uh, investigator, as an agent, uh, as a supervisor, and, and as a manager. Um, in 1984, I was foolish enough <laughs> to leave a position uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, <laughs> and to go back to FBI headquarters to become the deputy chief of counterterrorism. The, the FBI uh, is uh, broken into sections, and one of the sections there is the terrorism section. Uh, that section oversees and manages and coordinates terrorist investigations in the United States uh, by its 50-some 50 50 some offices. Um, as it relates to our program here, uh, in 1976, the Bureau decided that they were going to create something called the Terrorist Research and Analytical Center because what was happening is that the supervisors, the FBI supervisors that, were that they were bringing back to headquarters would stay two years, work in their specific fields of interest, and then go back to the field. And the Bureau was losing its, const its institutional knowledge. So they began to hire intelligence analysts, um, CIA, Department of Defense. Uh, when I got there in 84, uh, we were in a situation where uh, there was quite a bit of activity, domestic activity, both on the right and on the left. And we needed to include, increase the number of intelligence analysts we had. And, uh, and what we were looking for were, were people who had a broad understanding of history, world events, a foreign language, uh, had the ability to communicate both orally and in writing. And we just had a hell of a time finding them. And we always ended up taking that person that could write, hoping that over a year they would prove themselves to be capable of becoming, of becoming analysts. And it, it just seemed to me to really be a foolish, foolish situation. Uh, I had been fortunate enough uh, in my first trip back to FBI headquarters in the 70s to be able to roll in night class at Georgetown. And when I came back for the second time to headquarters in 84, I was able to re-enroll and I was in a program uh, called the Liberal Studies Program at Georgetown. And it was designed around values. Uh, the people that participated in the program were like myself, they worked during the day and uh, were look looking for their masters at night. And what I saw in that program, I thought, were the skills that were needed in an intelligence analyst. And I wonder why the hell aren't there programs, educational programs, to create intelligence analysts? If you wanted to be an intelligence analyst in, uh, in the 70s and 80s, you had to be in an in intelligence agency, in the military. The government totally controlled intelli intelligence education. Um, late 1986, I finished my tour at FBI headquarters. I was able to come back to Erie. Sue had been in Erie uh, for a year. We had found a, a, goth <laughs> a gothic house that we, we had wanted. <laughs> And uh, she uh, had graduated from nursing school in her 30s and was a home health nurse. So we got back together after a year, tough times, and got back together. And Georgetown was kind enough to allow me to 
continue and finish my master's. And Bob Allshaus, who was my professor uh, uh, and for two courses that we designed, he designed and put together. But in the course of that conversation with Bob, we talked a lot about this idea of why isn't there a college program to create intelligence analysts? Uh, Bob was head of the history department at Gannon, and I had graduated from Gannon. So uh, as I recall, Bob and I sat down with the, the catalog from Gannon, went through it, and said, you know, what courses would we want to create a program for an entry-level intelligence analyst? And we put together the program. And uh, unfortunately, uh, when we took it to the administration at Gannon, uh, they, weren't, they weren't interested. So that was one rejection. Uh, during this period of time, there was a five-year period uh, before I ended up at Mercier's to where uh, I was on the road as a teacher in Latin America for a year. Uh, I had uh, gone into a PhD program at SUNY Buffalo in history. I uh, was doing contract work for the government. There were good, year, there were good years, uh, good interesting years, but uh, I didn't, we didn't give up on the idea of the program. And then I, I met with the chancellor at Barron and the academic dean at Barron and presented the proposal to them. And uh, the academic dean said, oh, we do this already. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Alan Bellavard's here. Alan Bellavard is probably the catalyst of why the program at Mercy Earth came about. Alan, the reserve intelligence officer in the Navy, and I got together. Was it through AFIO, Alan, if you recall? Were you af active in AFIO at that time? Yeah, yeah. There's a professional organization called the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, AFIO. They have chapters around the country. And uh, they've been very, very supportive. And I was active in the organization uh, before I came to Mercier's. I was on the board of directors. I was the FBI representative. And, uh, but anyways, Alan and I got together and I talked to him about the program, the, the concept, and he liked the concept. And so uh, now we get back, now we get into the chronology. <laughs> so uh, November 19th, 1991, met with Dr. William Garvey, the president here. He'd been president f since Caesar was a corporal. Uh, <laughs> and uh, ran the school with a very, very authoritarian hand. <laughs> and uh, I presented the idea to him. I said, I, what, I'm wa what I want to create for Mercy here is, is a uh, is an undergraduate program based on a liberal arts education that would produce a graduate qualified as an entry level analyst for government and the, pri and the private sector. And, uh, and, the and the graduate would be able to produce actionable information for their decision maker. Okay. When anybody asks me what the, what's the meaning of intelligence, I always fall back on actionable information for the decision maker because that's really, that's really what it's all about, is what you're here, you students that are here, it's all about you being able to produce that actionable information for your decision maker. So, but the program was ideal for Mercy Harris. It's, ide it's ideal for a small liberal arts school because it's built on, on liberal arts, low cost. Garvey knew I was retired. First, first year, $7,000 salary. <laughs> it jumped to 10, to 10 the next year. Yeah. But the beauty of it, too, was that we didn't have to have a, a, a media curriculum. Uh, that fresh me, fr first year, we could develop a course and, uh, and build the program over, over the four-year over the four-year period. And what I've learned over the years is that it's a unique program like this that makes the difference for small liberal arts schools in their survival. And you, if you think about it, and you, you talk about schools that have reputations, small schools that have reputations, you're gonna find their expertise in foreign language and other fields that make them unique and make students wanna to go to them. 
So, so after the meeting with Garvey, uh, we agreed that I would do, uh, I would do a kind of a white paper, oral white paper. So I began, to, I got on the telephone and I began to call the different agencies that I had relations with. I, the Marshal Service, they had an intern program, they had, in, they had analysts, uh, ATF, Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, Gann and ROTC, what about cadets? Would you be interested in people, would you be able to get them into Intel? Uh, FAA, CIA, NSA. Uh, in December, I went to Washington and my relationship with the Association of Former Intelligence Officers was just a major breakthrough for me. I sat down, I sat down across from a woman who had been the Deputy Director of National Security Agency. And I pitched the program to she and a few other people that were there, and they loved it. They absolutely loved it. And the people I had talked to on the phone the week before said, where the hell have you been? <laughs> Why hasn't somebody done this before? And they, were, they pledged their support. They pledged their support. Um, I'll get more into I'll get more into NSA and what they did for us. But I was able to go back to Garvey and say, you know, I think this is positive. Everything I see is positive. There's no negatives. Um, at that time, Mike McQuillan was the head of the intelligence of the history department. Garvey said, "We're going to put you in history." That's a surprise. <laughs> so they put us in. So McQuillan. Alan Bellavaric, uh, we met. Uh, McCullen had gone over, looked at the program, and uh, we decided that we would do, we would go ahead and actually start the program in September of 1992. And uh, so what we had, it's, it's February, we're gonna recruit for September, our first class. Fun, fun. Andy Roth, at that time, was the Dean of Admissions. Really bright guy, really bright guy. And I can remember sitting down with Andy and I say, Andy, how, what are we gonna do to recruit students? He said, look, I got all these databases I can tap into. I said, yeah, we'll do history, we'll do civics, we'll do English. And because we knew what we were looking for in a student. And in my mind, I was looking for the kid that wanted, loved history and didn't know how the hell to use it in the real world. And this was perfect for kids like that. So we, we invented a trifold brochure. And on the, the cover of the brochure it said, why are the FBI, National Security, CIA interested in graduates from Mercyhurst? Sent it out and then when the responses came in, I'd get on the phone, call the kid, <laughs> and say, hey, let's talk about this program. It's new, and you, you know, and so on. So, well, uh, come September, we had 14 students. Absolutely amazing. And at that time, the criminal justice program was recruiting 30. I felt pretty good about being able to bring, to bring, in, four, bring in 14 students. So now what we're faced with is a blank slate. I mean, here's a program. You're starting from nothing. <laughs> And uh, wh what do you do? You know, uh, first of all, I think we'd, we'd solve the student problem. I felt that the, the attraction of, of where this could lead them would, would bring in the students. But what about faculty? With, for, uh, there was an Army Reserve Intelligence Unit in Erie. Yep, so I tapped, tapped into them, tapped into them for an introductory course. Uh, what about what about the classes? Uh, our program was different than the normal intelligence studies programs that were out there. They were based primarily on history. Ours was a totally different program. So what we had to do is we had to design courses from scratch. There were other professional organizations that were available that helped us. One of them was the International Association for, for, for uh, law enforcement anal analysis. And they had, the, uh, they had put together courses that they were teaching, which we could ride on uh, initially. Uh, textbooks, no textbooks. Um, Marilyn Peterson had written a book on uh, analysis in crime. Um, 
Who's our friend from CIA? Uh, the, the basic book. Huh? Mar Lowenthal. Lowenthal had been teaching at Columbia, and, and he had a book. Okay. So, 1994, uh, the students, the, pr the middle, the second year of the program, the course that we had was an integrating seminar, and the students began to produce a RIAP watch narcotics uh, using open source information. As an intelligence studies program, we didn't have access to classified information. So what we had to do is use public domain information. At that time, use of public domain information was somewhat frowned on by the intelligence community. Uh, today it's a very, very hot item and it's called, it's called OSINT. But uh, we were able to use that public domain information and uh, the following year we began to produce products on terrorism publication and publication for the National White Collar Crime. Uh, going back to the starting, uh, a physical space uh, was a problem in those days. Um, our f my first class I taught was in Latin American history, and it was in a, the ec ec home ec lab. <laughs> and my students were sitting at the kitchen table, <laughs> and and I was lean I was leaning up against the si the sink. <laughs> <laughs> but that's probably where I belonged. Some uh, another thing that we needed were internships. A crucial part of the program are the internships. And uh, th the people that I had first talked to after my meeting with Garvey and were very, very interested in providing internships. Also computers. Uh, there was one computer in the library at that time. And that's where NSA came in because I was able to go to NSA and convince them to give us our their excess their excess computers. Actually sent a student in a truck down to Fort Meade. <laughs> and he came back with 28 computers and they, they had a special case on them that where they wouldn't admit waves. Uh, and I couldn't use the computers but I sold them and picked up. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, you have to do what you have to do. <laughs> also there was uh, software for the computers. I would call s the software company and say, hi, Bob Heibel, uh, Mercy House College Intelligence Studies Program. Look, I've got all these kids that are going to be working, going on and working in the field. And th is there any chance that we could take a look at your, hard your software? And they'd send the software to us so that we can use it. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was really, really remarkable how, how willing they, they, were to help, they were to help us. 1995, first RIAP graduates, $30,000 salaries. They went to ATF, Pearl Associates, ONI, DNI, DNA, and Rockwell International. Two of them were commissioned, and one of them as an intel officer. One of those was a sergeant, a special forces sergeant that had come in the program. A couple of others had two-year degrees. 1995, we established CIRAC, the Center for Information Research Analysis and Training. Uh, the school had no money for us. Uh, I had talked to Garvey about it in 1994. He was kind of stonewalled me. But in 95, we finally been began to talk to him, be convince him that we would be able to generate income while giving our students the experience of working. It, it was a win-win-win situation. And uh, when I looked at the figures from 2009, we had over 50 different clients that we had served. During, during that period of time. Also in 1996, we partnered with a company called LexisNexis. Uh, they were the largest uh, company uh, with open source information and uh, they were in, in a, getting involved at that time in, in enhancing their law enforcement efforts. And uh, it was wonderful. We, our students had access to this huge database. Chuck, Charles, were you involved in that at that time? Yeah. Also that year, we got the Golden Candle Award from uh, a company called Open Source Solutions. September 1996, we had 69 students from 13 states, 14 states, three foreign countries. 
and we partnered Frank H with Frank Hagen, who's here tonight. Frank and I had, had done a couple classes together. He'd let me sneak in once in a while and lecture. And what we did is Frank's administration of justice program, we were able to create an intelligence studies concentration. Now, why we had to do that so early is one of the Belgian students was, had a law degree. <laughs> and what, we, what was that going to do? We were going to give him a bachelor's degree? No. <laughs> so it, it worked out very, very well. And over 30 students graduated from Frank program before the master's program developed. Okay, 1998, we did the first of uh, six annual colloquiums. And, and uh, this really was, a, I think, a very, very important step for us because what we did is we were able to bring 70 people to the campus. And uh, fortunately, I had the assistance of Sharon Sisko at the time, who was just, just an absolute dynamo. And Sharon, and uh, these people would come here and we, the first one, first conference we had is we brought in pe the people from the computers, from software, from government, from the NGOs, and they'd never gotten together before and actually had a situation where they could relax and talk. And uh, it, it was really, really, uh, um, I think, a breakthrough for us because it expanded, expanded our reputation during the, in the years that followed, and eventually, it led to the creation of the International Association for Intelligence Education. 9-11. Uh, 9-11 uh, um, certainly had an impact on uh, the demand for graduates from our program. But also at that time, I, I was um, doing a lot of SME su subject matter work on television. I, at that time, it was CNN, MSNBC, NBC. Uh, I'd get a call from uh, CNN and say, can you, be, you know, do a satellite lift tonight? And I'd have to rush up to WJET. But the point of that is that every time they introduced me, they introduced me as uh, the director of the intelligence studies first at Mercy Earth University. So it, it really worked very, it worked really to our advantage. 2001, the Society of Competitive Intelligence awarded us, us their highest award, the Meritorious Award. Uh, these professional organizations, there were people in those organizations, in this case, a fellow by the name of Jan Herring, who was the first national intelligence officer for technology at CIA, and they adopted us. They adopted our program. They loved our, pro they loved our pro program. 2003, the invasion of Iraq. How many of you ever heard of, of the uh, Iraq Most Wanted playing cards? Those were developed by two graduates from our program. And I looked, I have a couple decks, and uh, they actually have a Wikipedia site now. And on eBay, they're going for $450 a deck. <laughs> uh, 2003, we moved to the Hammer Mill Library, or moved from the Hammer Mill Library to Wayne Street. Uh, at that time, we had 131 students returning, 51 incoming freshmen, and we're training 50 analysts from the Department of Homeland Security who were coming, who were coming to Mercy Earth. Yeah. 2004 was really a banner year. See, in February of that year, thanks to a uh, $296,000 grant from the Department of Homeland uh, Department of Education, Secondary Education, or excuse me, U.S. Department of Education. Uh, we received a grant that allowed us to uh, institute the Mercier's College for Intelligence Studies, uh, the, the mission of which was to create a center for the study and application of intelligence. That is the first grant, federal grant and only federal grant we ever received. We never, in our history, never got a grant from the federal government for any, other, for any other reason. We may have received money from those agencies for work we did, uh, but th that was the only grant. Uh, subsequently, uh, in Erie, there's a, a, grant, uh, a grant known as the, f uh, the Black, Black Family Foundation, and they uh, gave us uh, $150,000 over, over three years for the Institute. 
a, an event that uh, just knocked me back w w took place in uh, April 2004. Uh, I was uh, making a presentation to a partner who was Alan Hamilton in Washington, D.C. And when I finished, he said, uh, we want to partner with you at Mercyhurst. We have 600 analysts that we need to train. Now, that you think about where we'd come in a period of time, it's really quite remarkable that this national company is saying, look, we want to partner with Mercyhurst. And what they wanted was they wanted a certificate that they, their analysts can say we have a certificate from, from Mercyhurst. Um, June 2004, a unique Master of Science in Applied Intelligence was approved by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. June 2004, uh, as a result of the international colloquiums that we had sponsored, uh, the International Association for Intelligence Education was formed. Throughout our existence, we have always aided and pushed for the professionalization of intelligence education. Uh, we never said intelligence studies are ours, never ours. And that, that, uh, that organization today is, uh, has over 300 members. We headed that organization for two years, and when we turned it over to them, uh, there were over 400 members, and their treasury had over $100,000 in it. Okay, uh, following up on the uh, Booz Allen, in August of 2004, we began teaching a prototype three-course graduate certificate program to analysts in Virginia. Uh, that program would develop into our lawn, online program, which was headed so capably um, by uh, Linda Bremer. Uh, that program eventually included Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, SAIC, SRA, and Department of Homeland, Se Ho Homeland Security. May 2005, 25 seniors graduated from intelligence studies with an average of two and a half job offers apiece and starting salaries of $52,000. Tim Kreisig was, was our first Marshall Scholar, was, uh, came out of, that, came out of that, that year. We did our first publications in June of 2005 the uh, Mercyhurst College Institute for Intelligence Studies Press. Uh, August of 2005, we added three additional faculty. One thing I'm very proud of is the fact that I had a hand in the hiring of the people that became our professors. And uh, each one of them was an individual story. I saved Jim from the business world. <laughs> Dave, Rob, Dave Grabowski, I saved him from the Nash National Drug Intelligence Center. And Bill Welch reintroduced him to, <laughs> Bill was, uh, I'm always proud of Bill, be Bill because um, he, I talked him into coming into the master's program so that we could use his background as an editor. And, uh, and he, he did, a, he's done a wonderful job, done a wonderful job as, as an instructor, particularly in uh, writing for analysis. Let's see. August 2005, anticipated enrollment was 225 undergraduates and 50 graduate students. So you think about the growth of the, pro of the program. Uh, 2005, we also, we also were able to finally produce a product, a very unusual product. Uh, in the, in the mid-90s, the uh, National Security Agency uh, revealed something called the Venona Project. And what the Venona Project related to was the fact that uh, mil the U.S. had been able to break the Soviet codes during World War II and that they had been able to not completely break them, but what the NSA did is they revealed, declassified 3,000 3, transcripts uh, from Soviet activity during that period. They were, they were in a form that was not searchable. So Mercier's took on the problem of putting those, putting those documents in word form. Uh, and uh, a student by the name of Allison Pinter put that project together. And that project, the results of that project uh, have been, has been used in several books 
uh, on, this, on the topic and also in uh, gra graduate papers by our, by, our by our students. March 2006, Director Robert Mueller advised the Congress that the FBI was sending employees to study physically at Mercier's College. And we had three people that came, analysts that came to Mercier's and physically studied. Uh, also, we, uh, we offered classes at FBI headquarters. It's the first time I'm aware of that any college or institution actually taught at the FBI Academy. 2006, we initiated what we call the Great Lakes Intelligence Initiative. And the goal there was to reach into the community and be able to, to help the community. And outgrowth of that was a series of projects, uh, studies that we did for Erie, for Erie bus businesses. Yeah, 2007 is part of the Great Lakes Initiative. We uh, tried to work with the Erie School District and the Boys and Curls Club of Erie. Uh, the idea that there uh, was a level below the intelligence analyst that you could call maybe the intelligence technologist, that person that who worked with the intelligence analyst and uh, we actually, with the Erie School District, uh, reached the point where we had designed a curriculum to be taught for years at Central High School. Uh, we had trained a teacher. She had gone through the master's program. And uh, just so happens that uh, our main contact died and the teacher retired. Uh, so the program never really, never really developed. But in my opinion, uh, it's a program that the Erie Community College is being developed. Might want to might want to take a look at. Okay, 2010 we had 500 graduates. 2013 we had 370 graduates, 50 resident graduate students, 85 in D.C. And the Mercier's pro our program at Mercier's was bringing in 20 percent of the freshmen. So 2016 the International Association listed 113 schools that now offer intelligence studies programs. 1992, there was only one. So, thank you very much. I hope that uh, you've enjoyed your trip down memory lane with me. <laughs> Jim? What a great story, huh? It is a good story. <laughs> I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna go through a chronology. I'm just gonna tell you a few stories. You've heard the great story, but uh, <clears throat> first of all, it's it's just great to see everybody. It's great that you could come back and uh, celebrate uh, this 30th anniversary of um, I think one of the. Uh, and I don't think this is hyperbole, one of the great academic contributions to national security in the last 30 or 50 years. Um, and that's, that's a result of your vision, um, but it's also a result of, you know Bob, uh, he's a persistent guy. <laughs> and uh, when you combine vision with persistence, you get great success. And um, I saw that every day. I witness it every day. You know when he's really excited, because the hands go. <laughs> right, the hands get going. And then you know he's really energized. In fact, I, you know, it, since we're telling stories and I'm not gonna go through the programs, and by the way, the resume that, uh, that was recited by Lindy, and at least in terms of me, none of those efforts were singular at all. So I'll tell you, I gotta tell you anything that any of those things that were cited were a group effort where we all sat around the table for a long time trying to work this thing out. Um, 
and I just happened to be part of the conversation from time to time, and it was just a lot of fun. But, you know, so back to sort of where, um, <laughs> where I first met Bob, he doesn't remember this perhaps, but I do. Um, I was a professor of military science uh, for uh, this part of Pennsylvania, and there were five universities I was responsible for. And one of the majors at Gannon said, um, you know, there's a guy up at Mercyhurst who is running a uh, intelligence program. His name was Higgins. He was an intel officer. He says, you really, uh, you got you to take, take this in. So I drove up with Higgins to uh, Mercyhurst where we parked, and uh, we went in the library. And Mercyhurst at the time was a labyrinth of hallways. In fact, it took you three years to figure out where you were going to eat. And so, <laughs> so we were winding through the library, and uh, we finally ended up on, on this obscure floor in an office with a bunch of pipes over the top. And there was this very distinguished guy sitting in the back. And uh, we sat down, and he had these PowerPoint slides, and he was very energetic about this program and where it was going to go. And that's when we first met. Uh, and we sort of talked for the next three or four years about um, all kinds of different things whenever I got a chance to get at Mercyhurst. But I, I was impressed then that somebody who had both that vision and that persistence was also um, humble enough to be able to sort of say, you know what, despite the environment, and despite all these obstacles and challenges in front, um, we're going to make this thing happen. And you did. And you think about life in terms of serendipitous occasion and chance. And uh, now and then, you know, I, Joanne, you'll have to correct me here, but uh, Ken Kesey wrote a book called Sometimes a Great Notion. There is a sometimes a great notion. And you just happen at some time in your life to connect. And uh, I was lucky enough to sort of connect in Erie, Pennsylvania at a particular time and place. And my life was different because of that. Uh, that would not have happened if Bob hadn't done what he tried to do and continued to persist in that particular effort. Um, you, also, you also have to think about uh, the whole notion of intelligence in a liberal arts college. And how's that going to go over with faculty? <laughs> really? It's a spy program. Right. OK. So think about, you not only have these external challenges ahead of you, but how do you sell this inside a university, at that time a college? How do you get people to sort of buy in? And those are sort of the challenges that had to be reckoned with as well. And so, you know, you can work your way through a chronology of accomplishments, but really sometimes the most important accomplishments are the relationships that you establish to make that successful. Um, and I think Bob had been, would have been a very rich man outside the FBI because he's a, he's a consummate marketer. He's really good on the phone. He likes the phone. And you got to have a guy like that. You really do. Because if you don't, you just can't establish those relationships that are ab absolutely instrumental and determinative in terms of success. Um, Bob already pointed out some of our external friends down the, down the road again and, and elsewhere uh, that were important in all this. Um, so what I'd like to turn to next, because I, I don't want to steal too much of your time in terms of all this. but. But um, the other thing about, I think, the Mercier's uh, intelligence phenomena is this notion of a team. And I know that's a trite term. It's used a lot. But there's a difference between a team of experts who bring a whole bunch of talented faculty together who happen to be very strong in a particular field and an expert team. We weren't necessarily a team of experts, but we became an expert team. And so when you talk about, and you start at the top, and I was lucky enough to witness this. I just got to see it every day. Um, 
But when you take somebody like uh, Chris Wheaton and you bring him in and you combine him with a guy like Dave Grabelski <laughs> and then you turn around and you say, who's that guy Wel Welsh? <laughs> and then I heard a bunch of murmurs about Mills. And you put those guys together with a very energetic, young graduate student, Don Wozniak, and boy, you really got something that you can unleash. And they, they did. <laughs> and they did. And they, they built that curriculum, that undergraduate curriculum. They built that graduate curriculum. And they persisted, back to that word, in making sure that you, the student, were tested every single course. And that was the beauty of the undergraduate experience and later the graduate experience. You didn't get off the hook. Anybody get off the hook in Wheaton strategic plan? <laughs> Anybody get off the hook in a communications class? Uh-uh. Because at that point, once you unleash that talent that I just mentioned, you're building a brand. There's a Mercier's brand out there. There's an expectation on the part of, for those who are current students right now, there's an expectation on the part of the alumni that you're going to have a particular skill set and experience that they have. And that's a tradition that has to be maintained. So I just mentioned some of the core that came in there, and I don't want to forget anybody, but those were sort of the, the people present at the creation. And then when you create a, a graduate program that's got a distance component, and that's a really tough thing to do, too. If you've never done it before, and this is 2005 or six, this is in 2022, where technology is so advanced that you can do so, some things. This is where you got to mash things together and run back and forth and the six hour drive to DC and back in a given day just to make things happen becomes difficult. But people like Linda Brimmer made that happen. How long did you run that program? <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah, forever. <laughs> and it was successful. And it's, you know, it's just, there are graduates of that program who, if you had a graduation here at Mercier's, in, in the auditorium over there, um, you'd say, who is this guy? And they were never here for a class, but they were graduating from Mercier's. Linda knew him. So we have a lot of people out here who have never, who are graduates who have never even attended a class here at Mercy Hills. So undergrad, grad, distance, there's a whole universe out there that these very talented people put together. And then there are also people who constructed programs that are absolutely instrumental. And I think this is key, that you offer an experience inside the curriculum so that the people can practice. And so we have this thing called CIRAT that Bob mentioned. And this is where we contracted NSA or, or elsewhere to bring work to Mercyhurst during the summer so the students could work various projects, practice that skill set that we imparted, and really not only use that skill set that's now honed, but use the credential that comes from that particular experience on their resume. And that was an extraordinary experience. Diane Chida, Suki Fuller, right? All these people down here were part of that. And people like Brad Gleason, who's not here, who ran those sorts of things. And, we, and, and when you, you take that synergy, produced by a class in the morning or an afternoon along with an experience in the summer. And then finally, I think sometimes the things that we forget, which these programs have a success because there's a virtuous, virtuous circle within the university 
that allows for that. So David Grabelski would walk up and down outside Wayne Street smoking three packs of cigarettes a day, <laughs> trying to figure out how many parents he was going to talk to going forward. But it takes on the front end the enrollment effort and on the back end the career services effort. Is Frank here tonight, Frank Rizzoni? No? But Frank made that happen in the end. So you could come in, do those things, and have a job on the other end. So a lot of success, but that was an expert team at work. Really at work. And when you, when you finally, in the end, talk about, um, talk about these sort of interdisciplinary programs that were mentioned, in sort of the resume, the, when you connect a department to another department, we have probably uh, the signature competitive intel program around because Shelly Fine put it together. Shelly, you around? There he is. Thanks, Shelly. <laughs> so we get back to universities and how they work. You have to have this sort of interconnection that takes place through across departments. And then finally, you hire young professors after that who can carry it on. So Drew Danzel's not here tonight, and Steve Zydek's not here tonight. Um, but boy, they carried the water for a while and did a really, really super job. And then Musa up here. Musa, I thought I saw you. There he is. Yeah, yeah. So just, just that itself in terms of a life in academia is worth it, to work with people like this. Um, and I guess what I'd ask you to do is give them a round of applause. Give them some <laughs> and uh, lastly, just let, let me give you, in my current life, I get to, um, I get to travel all over the world and uh, meet a lot of great people. Um, internationally, down in Washington all the time, um, uh, with key decision makers, and more often than not, they'll say, what'd you do before you went to war college? And I'll tell them, and uh, it's remarkable, the reputation that you have. It's remarkable what they know about Mercer that you wouldn't think they knew. And this isn't just in the, this country. They know about you in Nigeria. They know about you in Malaysia. They know about you in Croatia. They know about you in the Ukraine. They know about you in Argentina. That's, that's a remarkable credential. Um, and so those of you who are about to graduate or will, will graduate in the future, um, you're going to join a really, really remarkable cohort that has left this institution and is doing great things. Um, I mentioned the key words national security um, in terms of the contributions. The contributions when you talk about national security are also in the public safety arena through our law enforcement intel grads. And national security absolutely depends <coughs> on working capital and competition that is expertly informed by intelligence. And a lot of our graduates out there doing that. So across the board, there's an impact that our graduates have had. Our faculty have informed that instigated in, in some respects, uh, held you to account from time to time. Um, but <coughs> it wouldn't have been possible for the turnkey fob without that great vision. So I would, you know, one admonition as you go forward, find somebody with vision and persistence, make sure that you latch onto them at some point in your career, because <laughs> it'll make all the difference. Great seeing you all. It's wonderful being here again.
it's all about the students. We, I look back, the students carried the program. The, it's, it, it, I, th I think back now on uh, uh, how they become, they've become family. They have. And I, my, my wife kids me about using Facebook all the time, but it, it allows me to keep track of the graduates, how their families have d are developing. It's just absolutely wonderful to them. And uh, Jim and I have probably one of the largest families <laughs> uh, in Mercy Hears. So thank you very much. Well, let's open it up to you. What questions do you have? Comments? That's all I needed to hear at this point, as far as my personal satisfaction. There's a reception. <laughs> we had a great session with the faculty a month ago to, s to kick off the school year. And we talked about curriculum and what they want to make it as their own. And, you know, it is the idea of interdisciplinary. It's the idea of working with the religious studies program and area studies and it's how do you get completely embedded within that particular culture that we're in. And I, I do mean it when I say let's start with OSINT. Start with OSINT. It's the foundation. That's where we go. And we teach our students how to be strong ethical leaders, critical thinkers. And again, it's, it's you know, not moving away from national security law enforcement competitive Shelly, it's just the word, you know, that we got to move away from. 
But the idea of, again, what are those underlying skills? And it's f foundational, right? It's, it's the communication. It's mapping, mapping across from the corporate sector with all the way to ArcGIS with, with uh, the government side. And so I think it's really thinking about, again, how do we build a, a, the flexibility within the students? How do we stay true to what we are, which is really that applied approach, um, gaining that real world experience while, while we're here, um, and then also, um, well, Jason, now I'm all flustered and can't think. Um, I think it's, it's building on the expertise of, of the faculty that we have and knowing full well that we're going to continue to build those core skills that we know that we need to have, um, again, to, to allow that flexibility. And I just repeated myself 10 times, so. Let's go do it. So students, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, thank you for, uh, it's your Friday night and you're here, so thank you for that. Thank you for all of uh, the attendance that you showed today for your questions. Um, and we hope to see you tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Uh, with Dr. Craig Fleischer with a workshop tomorrow. Uh, with that, um, thank you students, good night. And, um, Bob, yeah, yeah. And uh, Bob asked uh, if you would like to see him one-on-one -on -one as we come up. Uh, we ask that you stay seated so that he can greet you. So just wait for Bob to head up the stairs. Yeah, well, that's all right. And then um, we'll see you all over at the CAE. So head out here and move to the right, uh, back to the, the building there, and we will see you for reception. Thank you.